please welcome Neil Stevenson, whose latest book out this week is Seven Eves. Anyway, I, I, I've got so many questions for you, Neil. Um, I am a huge fan. Well, let me let me ask you about um, you know scientists are known the greatest scientists. Uh, I would use cosmologists as maybe. Um, the most current examples, but they're by no means the only examples, have great imaginations, wild, insane imaginations, dare to think things that others won't. Um, I think your imagination is pretty heroic. Um, which comes first, the imagination or the science in the stories that you tell? In the stories that I tell, um, a lot of them uh, are, are the, the, begin with some kind of scientific uh, uh, idea that um, I think looks like it might serve as the basis of a, an interesting yarn, um, and then it, it kind of goes from there. So, for example, I wrote a trilogy called the, the Baroque Cycle that started with um, two random uh, observations that were mentioned to me by different friends at about the same time, and one of them mentioned the fact that Sir Isaac Newton was fascinated by alchemy and spent the, his last few decades running the mint. Uh, at the at the Tower of London, um, which is pretty weird, um, and and uh, the other thing was that Leibniz sort of was the one of the earliest computer scientists, and these two guys lived at the same time. They were the smartest two guys in the world, and they hated each other. Uh, so when I heard those two things, I just said, "This is a story. There has to be a story here. I have to." And he and independently is it, invented the calculus. Yeah, isn't it, isn't it the yeah. fact that, 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 that we, we attribute calculus generally to Newton, but we use Leibniz's notation? Yeah, I, I think more so in the English-speaking countries, uh, it's, it's attributed to, uh, at least for a while, it tended to be attributed to, to Newton because of the nationalistic passions that got stirred up during during that dispute, but yeah, uh, Leibniz's notation, the elongated S for integration and the little D for differentiation and all of that is the, is the notation that he used. So Snow Crash really is about the fact that World War II was actually about the dispute between Leibniz and uh, uh, Newton over notation. Well, yeah, yeah, the notation thing is a footnote, as it were, but um, um, this is, uh, uh, yeah, it, 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 it plays out, that story plays out later in, in Cryptonomicon, which right. is about code breaking and so on in, in World War II. Uh, let's talk about seven, seven Eves for a moment. Um, it begins with a cataclysmic event that, uh, you know, breaks the moon into seven pieces. Um, and you describe it in vivid scientific detail. Um, and then we understand the Newtonian mechanics that would explain what would happen after that, which is also equally terrifying. Um, I get the sense that um, planet Earth isn't quite enough for you, that you wish you maybe had seen a supernova, that possibly you, you wish that some of the extreme forces of the universe we had a better seat for here on Earth. Well, we, we do have a, a, a remarkably uh, good seat. Uh, I think sometimes we don't know it. Uh, one of the things that I picked up, um, so reading background information for Seven Eves was uh, that when the uh, Chelyabinsk meteorite came in a couple of years ago, some of you may have seen the dashboard uh, footage that was collected by various kind of incredibly calm, insouciant uh, Russian drivers um, of this event, and the thing that comes through is how bright it was compared to the sun. Um, it turns out that um, people who were standing in the open who looked up at that thing going overhead were sunburned. So even though the event only lasted for a few moments, the amount of UV that they took in during those moments was enough to give them facial sunburns so bad that a few days later they peeled. Which tells you that uh, uh, if you, the, from sort of some pretty elementary physics that the heat there was such that the light coming off of that bolide was more like the light uh, of an arc welder than, say, the light of a, of a candle flame. Um, and there's a different, but since you asked, uh, I'll, I'll put it in the same bucket. Uh, there's a, some other research I came across uh, 
in writing the uh, a story about the tall tower last year, um, where um, <clears throat> there was a, a satellite in orbit around the Earth whose purpose was to pick up gamma ray bursts from from very far away from from deep space, and they kept they kept maxing out the the, the sensor on this thing. They would see a spike so big that the, the sensor was overloaded and couldn't record the data. And uh, they couldn't figure out what on Earth or what off Earth could, could possibly cause a, a gamma ray spike of that intensity. Finally, they figured out that they were coming from below. And that the timing of these gamma ray bursts was having to coincide with big thunderstorms that were happening down in the atmosphere underneath. Um, and eventually they figured out that there are these incredible cascades uh, of electrons and positrons going up and down in big storm towers that produce, uh, uh, well, first of all, positrons are antimatter. So we have like significant amounts of antimatter in thunderstorms. And one of the things that comes out of those is bursts of gamma ray activity so powerful that if you're flying through one in a plane when it hits you, it'll give you your lifetime dose of, of gamma radiation in a moment. And it doesn't happen to people because people try to avoid flying through incredibly violent uh, thunderstorms. So it's kind of a self-correcting uh, problem. But, but if you did want antimatter, that would be the way to get it. Yeah, yeah. So the, um, uh, and, and these things manifest themselves high in the, uh, up, high above the atmosphere as these, these sprites, these, uh, these flashes of, of light that look like kind of red jellyfish hanging uh, above the atmosphere that last for a fraction of a second and then, then fade away. Uh, so there are, uh, so if you, uh, maybe not supernovas, but uh, almost comparably amazing phenomena that, that happen around us. Uh, all the time, and uh, we may not just be aware of. And, and everything you just told us is science fact. Is that right, Neil? Yeah, yeah. But uh, you know, I mean, I'm, it's filtered through my kind of popularizing mm -hmm. narrative. Yeah, it's it's all. This is all. You can go go look this stuff up. And uh, what was your original career track? Oh well, I don't think I ever had a career track. <laughs> but I I was I was uh, I studied physics uh, in, in college. And um, uh, ended up getting sort of seduced into um, geography of all things because they were doing lots of cool stuff with uh, with computers, and uh, also because uh, it made me feel like I might be able to do something useful, kind of with with environmentalism. Um, but uh, in the uh, geography uh, in the cartography lab at the geography department, they had uh, the first. Uh, so sort of computer graphics displays that I had ever been able to get my hands on and play with, and that was pretty addictive. Um, so anyway, I came out with a sort of mishmash uh, degree that that turned out to be unmarketable, and um, so I took. <laughs> I yeah, I, uh, well done. <laughs> I, I took a couple of years off and wrote uh, a couple of novels uh, just to see if that would work. And I assumed I'd go to grad school, but ended up uh, publishing one of those novels. And then uh, that was my career track from, from then on. Well, uh, congratulations on all of that. Um, <laughs> let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about um, the fact that we've had two movies this year about uh, mathematics, mathematicians. And of course, we've just, uh, the passing of uh, Mr. Nash uh, because of not wearing a seatbelt in the back seat of a taxi cab, but it's happened to Bob Simon, happened to Princess Diana, someone will write an article about that. Um, but uh, anyway, the uh, Nash movie was a breakthrough movie in terms of science, but I'm interested in how, I mean, I, I, did you see uh, The Imagination Game? Yeah, uh, the imitation, the, the imitation, imitation game, game. Excuse me, yeah. the imitation game. Did you see it? Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's probably good that they did that movie, but uh, I mean, I suspect you would give it a pretty dreadful review. Well, the uh, I, I sort of turned to um, to my friend George Dyson, who uh, who knows more about this stuff that, than I do. And I heard him talking about this just a, a couple of weeks ago at a, a conference. Uh, he, he interviewed a, a lot of people who knew uh, Turing for, for his book, <coughs> Turing's Cathedral, 
Uh, he said, interestingly, that the, the thing about the invitation game that he found most objectionable was not that they sort of rearranged the story in order to make it fit into a movie, because you kind of expect that, but that um, Turing was actually a really nice guy. Right. <laughs> and everyone who knew him talked about what a sweet person he was and how well he got along with his co-workers and just what a great guy he was, but they went for the the, the, the sort of stereotypical portrayal so Flynn is a remote jerk. No, and, and here, I mean, as I was watching that movie, I so dreamed if it in fact had been a screenplay that came from Cryptonomicon, which has Alan Turing and some others as characters in a much bigger, bigger story. But here, in just a few lines, you convey a sense of Alan Turing in all of his controversy that I think is some absolutely beautiful fiction writing. Um, if you'll permit me. Um, Al delicately asked him one day if Lawrence, Lawrence is the character uh, that is invented by uh, uh, Neil here, Al delicately asked him one day if Lawrence would terribly mind calling him by his full and proper name, which was Alan and not Al, which is the moment you begin to suspect that this person is somebody maybe really big in the science world. Lawrence apologized and said he would try very hard to keep it in mind. One day, a couple of weeks later, as the two of them sat by a running stream in the woods above the Delaware Water Gap, they were at the Institute for Advanced Study at that time at Princeton, Alan made some kind of an outlandish proposal to Lawrence involving penises. It required a great deal of methodical explanation, which Alan delivered with lots of blushing and stuttering. He was ever so polite and several times emphasized that he was acutely aware that not everyone in the world was interested in this sort of thing. Lawrence decided that he was probably one of those people. Alan seemed vastly impressed that Lawrence had paused to think about it at all and apologized for putting him out. They went directly back to a discussion of computing machines and their friendship continued unchanged. But on their next bicycle ride, an overnight camping trip to the Pine Barrens, they were joined by a new fellow, a German named Rudy, von something or other, who figures prominently in the novel. Alan and Rudy's relationship seemed closer, or at least more multi-layered, than Alan Lawrence's. Lawrence concluded that Alan's penis scheme must have finally found a taker. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's funny, it's human, it's sensitive, and it's scientific fact. I mean, it's basically based on biographical, factual details in a science fiction dog. That, that, there are not many people who can do that sort of thing. I'm, I applaud you, sir. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thanks. So, um, what did you? What did you love? Are you girdles in this uh, book, uh, Turing. Uh, what do you make of that whole character of uh, mathematicians at the time and what they achieved? Because in some sense, you try to smoosh them together with some of the mathematicians of our age and what could be achieved if they all were in the same room together. Well, they were. They belonged to a kind of heroic age. I think of uh, of logic and mathematics that doesn't come around very often. May, it may not come come around again, but there was this moment when a number of threads kind of came together uh, during the the 1930s, and um, a, a number of fundamental problems were solved that all kind of turned out to be kind of the same uh, problem. And and uh, the story of of computing uh, emerges from that from that confluence. And that is uh, really one of the most remarkable uh, stories um, in, in history, even just by itself. But when you fold that together with the fact that uh, these same people were instrumental in, in winning the biggest war in history by doing math, uh, the, the story just breaks through into a realm that's completely unbelievable. I mean, it's just beyond anything that you could even consider writing down in, in a work of, of fiction. Uh, and so it's kind of the point where fiction writers, I think, just have to you know, just sort of back away and you can maybe talk about it, you can maybe tell that story in a fictionalized way, uh, but it, that's the point where you just have to bow to, to you know, to the true full weirdness of, of science and you know, what has happened in the last century uh, and, uh, and become more a, a storyteller than a story creator, I guess. Hmm. A quick final question, and that uh, would be, 
Um, what do you think the responsibility of your readers is to understand science, or the readers of the future is to understand science in, in any significant way? Neil, you want to grab any of that before we take questions? Well, I mean, uh, uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm always torn between deciding me that, that reads random Facebook posts and, and Twitter <laughs> arguments and, and, and seething with rage, you know, why, why can't these people think more carefully, you know, why don't they, you know, why don't they, they appreciate or understand science? And the part of me that needs to make a living writing books and, and getting people to read them. So, uh, 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 pe people, uh, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, novels are entertainment. And um, if I write anything in a kind of finger-shaking, hectoring uh, tone, um, that's not very entertaining. It's, it's not going to work. Um, I so, that works for any of us. Yeah. That? I, yeah. I don't think that works for any of us. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that's, so um, the best that I can do is, is to sort of beguile readers into to getting science and being interested in, in science by, by trying to tell stories about scientists in which they're portrayed, you know, not as the remote weirdo nerd in the imitation game, but as the more human kind of person with, with good and bad points, with, with flaws and with virtues, um, and to portray the kind of journey that they go on and the, the, the processes that they have to, to go through. And I think that, that those stories read better and, and read more true uh, the, the closer they are to what actual scientists uh, go through. So that's kind of what I'm aiming for. I'm not saying I always hit that mark, but, but that's kind of the approach that I take um, not in trying to uh, impose a responsibility on a reader, but maybe trying to get them to, to see things from a, a science-oriented point of view and, and maybe voluntarily take that responsibility on.